Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Richard Schreiber. He is the Associate CMIO of Penn State Health. Dick, thanks for joining me today. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, uh, it's my pleasure. So, as I do with all my guests, I, I think it's always important to get a little bit of background history. You're a physician, um, but not your average physician, if anybody ever is. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are. Yeah, I'm one of those people that uh, always knew that uh, he or she wanted to be a physician. In fact, I started wanting to be a veterinarian, but that's another story. But when I got into medicine, uh, I was enthralled mostly by internal medicine, uh, the, the challenges, the difficulties, uh, and the, uh, all the different aspects of difficult diagnoses, lots of laboratory information, all of that. So that evolved over time, not only as a, that I was an internist, but I also became the squeaky wheel, known as the squeaky wheel at my various institutions, meaning I always needed more data. I always needed more information at my fingertips. I was the kind of person that always thought there was a better way. And when you're dealing with paper and slips of paper and handwriting that I can't read, including my own, I naturally fell into what now we know as the field of informatics. And... Uh, my first foray was into laboratory display, and I've been doing that ever since. In fact, I had more, my most recent uh, meeting about laboratory display uh, about an hour ago. <laughs> so it's still something that I'm working on. Uh, I was in full-time uh, internal medicine practice doing office practice, hospital work, nursing homes, uh, rehabilitations, home visits, the whole bit in primary care and also secondary care. And I slowly evolved into the position of uh, what I later termed to be the chief medical informatics officer at my local hospital that I joined. Details aren't important, but uh, over time, uh, my, the institution where I primarily work uh, first worked with uh, one uh, on its own privately, and uh, we put in an uh, electronic record, and that was quite successful. Then we were bought by a larger institution. And I don't know, Nick, if I should be naming individual institutions, but if I can, I would. Well, uh, Holy Spirit was bought by, by uh, Geisinger. And uh, more recently, in November this past year, 2020, uh, we were sold and bought by Penn State. So now I am the associate CMIO for the Penn State Health System, and my primary uh, locus of action is at Holy Spirit, the hospital that I've worked in since 1984. That's my uh, informatics story in something of a nutshell. So that, that's great. First of all, I want to call out the fact that you were interested in internal medicine before uh, House, the TV series was a name, because it sounds to me that's like, that was the trigger for you, right? That was the, the mystery of diagnosis. Is that, uh, is that a fair assessment? It is. I was toying between ophthalmology and internal medicine during my early fourth year of medical school. Ophthalmology because I could do things, uh, surgery, uh, my brother became a surgeon. My, my father was a surgeon. So I thought I would be in one of the doing arts, as it were. But as I remember this very clearly. I was looking at the fundus of a woman with uh, sarcoidosis, and it was fascinating. It's interesting. Uh, we were trying to help her out. I'm a fourth-year student, so I wasn't doing much. But I looked at that, and I said, well, that's really important, and this woman is getting good ophthalmological care. But what about the rest of her body that's affected by sarcoidosis? And that's when I said, okay, this ophthalmology stuff is fun, but I think I want to do the internal medicine. So that was the intellectual point at which I wanted to take care of the whole patient and the bigger problem. I love it. I, I, <laughs> it's fascinating how those inflection points sort of direct you in a very uh, specific sort of career direction. The squeaky wheel, I think, um, you know, data and the, the need for more information to make decisions We've seen that increase over time in healthcare. You know, there's no question we've moved from this paper-based record, which, you know, historically would be these four by six cards that, you know, your um, family practitioner would record your whole history for your whole life on at one point. We've now expanded that. And you run through the different organizations, but one of the things that really stood out about you and 
um, is you've interacted with many of the different EMRs, right? You've had experiences, so you're, you've seen it all. Can you share a little bit of the, the good experiences as well as the things that you've learned along the way? Let's start with the uh, good experiences. Once you become facile with an electronic record, it's just like any other tool. I mean, I'm not gonna compare myself to a surgeon, but surgeons know this inherently when they learn an operation, say an open cholecystectomy. Well, then they learn how to do laparoscopic cholecystectomies, new instrumentation, new tools, new techniques, and they adapted to it and became expert at it. Well, of course, the EHR is not as elegant as a laparoscope, but my point is that everybody in medicine can use the EHR as a tool to get what he or she needs in order to take care of patients. And, you know, we might have thought of it as a typewriter before or uh, a PAX to be able to see our x-rays right away while we're still with the patient and show them the x-ray, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so each new feature of an EHR, whatever it may be, is another tool in our toolbox as to how do we take care of patients. So access, unbelievable access. I mean, the days of my routing in the hospital and not even being able to find the chart. I mean, anybody that neglects that as a feature uh, certainly has forgotten what uh, working on paper was all about. It was horrible. Then I had zero information and nobody knew where that chart was. I couldn't even document if I went to see the patient, if I knew them well enough that I could just go in and at least see the patient, talk to them, tell them I'd be back later when I finally found the chart. I mean, that was agonizing. And patients lost trust in us when we did not have the information that we had. Now there's essentially short of, you know, an, an electric storm and, you know, no power whatsoever. Uh, we have instant access anywhere, anytime, even if someone else is using the chart at the same time. So access is clearly one of the top highlights of electronic records. So is access to the information. I can find anything that's in there if I'm good enough. That also, the mirror image of that is, if you're not so savvy at using an electronic record, is finding all the information because now there is a ton of information, uh, the proverbial you know, drinking from a fire hose. And the electronic record is much like that. I can do things intermittently. I can write a temporary note, which I'm not intending for everyone to see yet because I have further things I want to do before I publish the note. Um, well, your viewers couldn't see what I just did, but I put publish in quotes there. Um, your listeners, excuse me. Uh, but what I'm getting at is uh, I can do incremental work. And you can't do that really in paper unless you go back and forth. And that's a nuisance too. Uh, communication with other clinicians. If there was such a thing as good interoperability, I could send my records on a patient, you know, across the country to San Francisco in a in an instant. Well, that's coming to be a reality. Uh, it, it certainly is better than it used to be, but it's not where we need to be yet completely. But it's better than it has been. I could go on. So that's mostly the positives. The downsides: usability. You know. I think anybody that's ever used an electronic record or watched their doctor try to use one, uh, even if you're a lay person, understands that these are not necessarily usable. I always like to distinguish, however, different aspects of usability because many people blame the EHR for long notes, copy paste, repetitiveness in the chart, inability to find things. You know what? A lot of that's regulatory and a lot of it just isn't necessary. Now, CMS is trying to decrease the burden, at least on ambulatory practices, so you don't have to document quite as much as, as you used to as of January 1st this year, but we're nowhere close to what we really need to be. Your notion of the four by six index cards reminds me that when I first went into practice as an internist, there were a couple of um, uh, retiring family practitioners in the area and they would send me their patients. One of them indeed kept his notes on three by five index cards. And then sometime in the late 50s, changed to four by sixes. The entire record on, say, a 60-year-old person that he'd been taking care of since he gave birth to them was maybe an inch or two thick of index cards because what he was documenting was only the essentials. So if there was a note from, you know, January of 1966 that said ST, temp 104, lymph nodes enlarged, two plus pharyngitis, three plus exudate, positive strep, Rx, PCN, VK, 500 QID times 10 days. One line typed 
I know exactly what he was looking at. Now, for any of your listeners that didn't, that aren't medically inclined, I'm describing someone with a strep throat. And you don't have to have five paragraphs, including the family history, unless it's pertinent, like two other people in the household are sick. What I'm saying is records are con were concise back then. They are not anymore. Why are they not concise? Mostly regulatory. That's not the EHR's fault. So there are downsides, but we have to be careful when we place blame. You know, I, and, and I think that's important. First of all, I, I love that you cite the EMR as an incremental tool set. I hadn't thought about it in that way, but you're right. You can sort of keep this private, whereas that wasn't possible with the medical note, unless you were sort of inserting sheaves of paper. I, I, I mean, I think great point, because that's the way that we think through medicine. But you're right, it's not a, a technology issue. It is this regulatory and, and I, I want to say mostly billing associated that demands that all of these things are included to prove you've done something. And, you know, I'm, I've, I've got this constant phrase ringing in the back of my head as we're talking through this. If it isn't documented, you didn't do it was what we were, you know, instructed. It, is that part of the challenge? Is that something that we should be trying to change, can change even? I mean, it, it seems like it's inextricably linked with the EMR at this point. It is. Um, but I think you're making, or I'm going to say you're making two points here. Mm -hmm. Your second point about linking and, and so on is one thing. The first was the incrementalism. And being that that's an important theme for you. In a, on a paper chart, we had the documentation, we had patient complaints, we had laboratory tests and x-ray reports, but no images, just as an example. Now we have linkages to the actual image. We have a link to the patient portal, which had not just the information that the patient phoned in for refill on their prescription, but the questions they were asking, and it's in real time. So the EHR incorporates new functionalities along the way that we never had before which is a good thing. And now I can look up, you know, in certain uh, vendor products, at least, I can look up their medical records from Indiana, you know, when the patient was hospitalized out there, which I could only get as a copy or faxed and then incorporate into my paper chart as an addendum, you know, but now I can look at it in, in virtually real time. So the EHR incrementally increases that. And your second point, is can we do something about this? And the, the answer is yes, we can. Right now, if I say, I discussed this with the patient, that doesn't suffice. It documents that I did something, and in the absence of documenting something, then I never talked to the patient according to the lawyers. But if I say, I discussed this with the patient, that's not gonna be substanti substantial enough. I have to say what I discussed and what questions I answered. Uh, and what questions the, the person uh, actually asked me. So we are, we are plagued with this enormity of documentation that really hides the patient's story, in my opinion. There are some people over my years of experience who can somehow bring an entire patient's story into sharp focus in a page. I, I admire that. I, can, I can't do that. Some people say I sometimes can do that but it's usually when I'm dictating a note and I just reiterate the, the whole story that I heard. Uh, but some people can really hone it in in a few sentences and you really get the idea of what was discussed between patient and doctor. Um, but I think we are incredibly burdened with, with regulations and what the insurance companies and the lawyers and so on expect of us that it really gets in the way of our practice. I think it's going to need to be a conjoint effort. And one of the things that I've written about before in calling to informaticists is really we have to stand up for our patients so that our notations, our documentation, and the EHR really reflects the interaction between doctor and patient and not justifying how we bill or how much time we spent or the complexity of care. Most medical care is complex to begin with. How can I distinguish between moderately complex and very complex? I mean, really, come on. And for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Richard Schreiber. He's the associate CMIO for Penn State Health. We were just talking about the evolution of uh, the EMR and the challenge of satisfying regulatory uh, requirements and that overhead that essentially commits us to putting in information that 
I guess, in my mind, doesn't contribute to the clinical course, really. It uh, serves a billing purpose, but that's really a separate activity. And, and part of me thinks that the EMR came from that heritage, which is why we have the model that we have versus coming from a clinical end. Is that, I mean, I, you know, as I think about the VA system, which didn't have so much of that billing aspect, perhaps that was a, a better clinically orientated system, if you've got any familiarity with that. I don't have any personal experience using uh, their current system, the VA's current system, uh, but I've seen records from the VA when I shared patients with, uh, uh, with a veteran's uh, clinic or hospital. Um, and I've talked to a number of people who are very intimately aware of the VA system. And yes, I think they feel that their system is much more clinically oriented in the sense that they enter the, the EHR and they're right away in the space that they need to be. But you're right. I mean, the essence of a the bill, the configuration of an EHR right now is actually a spreadsheet. I mean, if you look at laboratory data, it's actually a spreadsheet. And that's why you can sort it from recent to old or old to recent or right to left or left to right. Those are all, if you don't mind the trade name here, those are all Excel functions. Right. It's really well. Well, what's Excel? Excel is a business program. <laughs> that's a great point okay so um I, as you've seen the sort of innovation you you've spanned across all of these you know i think that the positives you know by far and it's interesting you highlight that that you know the the notes weren't available i remember that as that was a whole section in the outpatient clinic here are all the the, the people that we don't have notes for i mean wow what a what a tragic thought but we don't have that anymore we look at the way that things are uh, developing now. You're obviously a, a, a focused medical informaticist. That wasn't something that existed, but it's now sort of central to everything that you do. Where is this going? I mean, where do you think we can go from this point? Have we finished? You know, we, we've, uh, we've solved all of the problems. We've delivered electronic medical records. It's time to sort of pack up and go home. <laughs> No, we're nowhere near finished. Here's, here's my vision. I've had this vision for a number of years, and uh, some of it's actually coming true, not by me, but by others in the field. My feeling is that the EHR and everything in it should be a byproduct of the visit. And the way to get there is, and here's the dream, I walk into a patient's room. My identification uh, tag recognizes me as I walk through the threshold of the door, welcomes me into the room, introduces me to the patient in the bed, and knowing my uh, preferences, flashes up on the screen the patient's most recent vital signs, their blood sugars if they're diabetic, uh, the last note that I wrote, maybe a new image report that I hadn't gotten. It's all right there on the screen as I walk in. I'm conversing with the patient, Sure, there's some social interaction that has nothing to do with, with medical care per se, but I'm getting to know the patient, maybe the family is there, we talk a little bit. And as I'm going through my history, my exam, it all gets recorded through natural language processing and any other techniques that enable a, the generation of a note. And then as I'm talking with the patient, I'm, I'm telling them, well, this test is better, this test is worse, I'm going to repeat a blood count or whatever the test is. We need to get an x-ray of such and so because of this reason. And those are all generating orders and documentation that I reviewed all of those results. Then I'm talking with the patient, answering their questions, addressing their concerns, speaking with the family, whatever else is necessary. The machine is generating my note, is generating my orders. I need to look up at the screen and validate and verify. And when I walk out of that room, I'm done. That's it. And all of those results, all of that information goes directly to the patient portal so that the patient can have a written record of what we just talked about, uh, the results, everything at their disposal so that the next time I come in, they can say, hey, wait a minute, you talked to me about such and so, but I didn't understand it. Tell me more about whatever. And we can go over that and that gets documented so that I'm not having to do the mechanics of the search and documentation and ordering I can focus on the patient and the machine, the electronic record knows our conversation and I can validate. And of course I can edit and improve upon that. 
But the important concept here is I can enter the room and have what I need at my fingertips. I can leave the room knowing that I'm complete. How far away is this? I don't know. Certainly many years. Um, when I first got into informatics, which was officially was 2005, I started dreaming like this. We didn't really even have RFID, or at least it wasn't any good. Uh, we didn't have any suitable natural language programming. We didn't have uh, what one company calls a virtual scribe. Uh, we had scribes, but we didn't have a virtual scribe. Well, all of those things now exist. And there's no reason that some smart, you know, 20 something can't take my RFID and put on a screen my preferences for what data I want first thing. So I think that might be, you know, in the near future. But putting this whole picture together, no fewer than five, probably more like 10 or 15 years. But that's not bad. That's not bad. So I, I think what you're saying is that from a perspective of clinicians still, there's still plenty of work to do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think uh, anybody entering into the field of informatics has job security. And as you think about your future and, you know, the future of the people that come uh, behind, what are their main areas of focus? What should they be thinking about? What should, where should they focus their time, do you think? Well, there's a lot of engineers coming into medicine. And I think engineers have an advantage over some of the rest of us because they, they have a systems way of thinking. They think in terms of what is connected to what. And I think if we have what my boss calls sys I can't even say it, systemness, think in terms of the larger structure that doctors interact with the patients, of course, but also with nursing and laboratory personnel and physical therapists and pharmacists and the whole gamut. If we can think in terms of that larger picture and include in that our informatics uh, analysts and others who are good at programming and others that understand the clinical parts of informatics, if we can teamwork that, then I, th I think that should be the focus of people coming up to replace me in this business. It's interesting you, you finish with that because as I look at the existing medical uh, student recruitment process that hasn't changed in years. It still remains the same assault course, uh, you know, that requires, in fact, it's gotten even harder, I would say. Whilst there's some uh, suggestion of looking outside of the traditional sciences and so forth, that's a, an especially hard path to take for people to do. So maybe we should be focusing on medical education and you know that aspect of it to change the way that we recruit in or is this a different recruitment pathway i i think um things like stem training is is still critical um, i believe that the humanities is absolutely critical to all the clinical bedside uh, medicine but i also believe that we need to encourage people who are creative and more right-brained to come up with new ideas because in the absence of new ideas, we're stagnant. Interesting. I, I, I agree. I mean, I think we, we have to change the way that we bring folks in. And, you know, it starts at that sort of early age um, to sort of broaden the perspectives. But uh, that, that remains a continued challenge. Anyway, one that will keep people in, invested for many years to come. Unfortunately, as we do uh, every week, uh, we've run out of time. So it just remains for me to uh, thank you for joining me on the show. It's always a pleasure to catch up, Dick. I'm uh, excited about the future and uh, the future you paint. So thanks for joining me on the show today. Thank you for the invitation. Again, it was a pleasure and uh, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, The Incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. 